continue and continue and continue. And we don't even sometimes get to the Word of God. We just be in His presence. Um, because when we're in that presence with Jesus, He changes us. Um, and we draw closer to Him and He draws closer to us. But so many times we, we cut things short. Um, and it's not due to anything else, but we feel that sometimes it just needs to move on. Uh, but yeah, I wait for the day that we can just continue in Jesus. Um, that would be awesome. Um, where to start this morning? I've got so many things that I want to share with you over the, the next two weeks or so. Um, and I want to, and I thought about what happened last week. Sunday was Mother's Day. And you know, I'm thinking Father's Day is coming up. Um, and it made me think during the week we uh, at Wednesday when we read, um, uh, I think Tony Anaki read something about that we we become sons of God, and then it made me think about Jesus, and it made me think, but how do I know Jesus, and, and how does it all come together? So Father's Day coming, and so this is not a Father's Day message at all. <laughs> I don't even think so. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Father. Because so many times we focus on Jesus and that's 100% correct. But we also need to know that through Him we get to the Father. So let me give you a little bit of background about my own dad. I uh, grew up in a little town called Brakpan or in Gauteng. Um, Dan will know it's, it's not the best place to be. You would walk around and there would be um, people of all society, walking around, and not being good. Um, you would see a lot more people who don't have work, uh, who don't have money, who are drug addicted in a little town like that. Funny hairstyles. What are you talking about? Um, I did have funny hairstyles at that time. <laughs> because I was 18, okay? <laughs> and um, my dad was a fireman, and he very good fireman. He qualified to be a paramedic at 20 years old and he had a bright future ahead of him. But then he allowed certain things to occupy his life. One of those things was alcohol. And he got addicted. And his whole family, even up to today, um, a lot of them are still addicted to alcohol. That's what they do when they get together. They drink and they have fun and they booze and they do whatever. And, um, and my dad was just unfortunately one that couldn't handle it. So he would always go overboard. He would always be the one that would um, fall over. Where the others would still drink and sort of contain it and mellow with it and go with it. But he would be the one just falling over. He would be the one that wants to give me a lift on the motorbike but can't lift the motorbike so we fall over and the motorbike on top of my legs and, and other men have to come and rush to put up the motorbike again. That was the kind of father I had. A father who beat up my mom uh, a couple of times in front of us. Um, where bloody nose, eyes were swollen like this. That's the kind of dad that I grew up with. Um, and if you look at today's life, at what people experience from a physical father, and it's becoming less and less that the parent, or even specifically the father, are involved in the parents or the, the kid's life. Many years ago, a parent or a father would take his child with him to work from a young age, and he would learn from his father. He would see what his father does. He would see how his father talks and reacts and protects and encourages other people. Um, if I'm just thinking, Eric and then you guys had a farm, and how nice it was to be able to take your kids with you on the farm and let them drive a tractor, be kids. But they were always involved with the parents and what they were doing. So they were leading constantly. And that reminds me of the Father God how involved he was with his son all the time. Um, you guys remember in Genesis 1, I'm just going to read one or two verses here quickly. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without void, uh, without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now we all know that that speaks about Jesus of being the light. 
if we go to John 1, this is where I want to start this message of the Father, of how he was involved with his Son from the beginning. And John 1, verse 1, and we all know that he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Now, just that last uh, uh, verse 2, he says, He was in the beginning with God. I can imagine if I looked at my father, that he was almost never there. He had almost no influence in my life anymore because of things he did and was drunk and lying in, a, in the bed. And that's where I saw him. He would come on a Friday evening. He had two cases of alcohol with him or beers with him. And I'd see him on Monday morning goes to work. That's it. Um, and during the week, no real influence because, again, he would get home and he would drink and do all these kind of things. Um, but the Father, God the Father, who is the perfect example for us what a father should be, and it says here, he was in the beginning with God. Jesus was with God from the beginning. And what that tells me is that God never left him. He was always together with him. And if I could just bring it back to a little bit more physical side, is that if God the Father was physical here, Jesus would go inside. God the Father would be walking and Jesus would be walking with him. If God the Father said something, Jesus would state it with him. If God the Father would heal somebody, Jesus would be there with him to heal him. And the word speaks about that, and we'll go through a couple of verses like that. And it says, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made. Again, everything that was done, everything that the Father said had to be, came through the word, came through Jesus. See, Jesus is an epiphany, is that the right word? of being sonship to the Father. He did everything that the Father did. And if you Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see that he says, I do nothing without hearing it from the Father. See, the Father, if we can listen to him, things will be created in him. Because when we see the Father, we see Jesus. Christ. And if I want to tell you about Jesus, I have to tell you about the Father. Because he is the one. God so loved the world that he gave you. God loves us so much. And he loves his son so much. Turn with me to Matthew 17, please. From verse 1. This is such a well-known piece, and you can make lots of spiritual stuff out of that. But I just want to take out some physical things out of it for us looking at the Father. And this is the, where Jesus got transfigured on the mount. In verse 1, it starts and he says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before him, for them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And let me just stop there. What a marvelous thing just happened. They were walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, seeing Jesus do all these miracles, and if there was any doubt in their mind that he is the Son of God, this was now a proven fact to He's standing there in front of them. His face starts shining. His clothes start lighting up like light. Amazing. So much so that Elijah comes and Moses comes and they start talking to Jesus and Peter, James, and John. says, oh, whoa, whoa, let's just build some tents here, tabernacles for you guys. We all just stay here. What a marvelous thing it should have been. How marvelous it is. Marvelous it is to be in the presence of Jesus, in that Godhead, in that spiritual side of Jesus, and be with him, and we're in him, we can do everything. Um, and Jesus wants us to do that. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And then Peter answered and said, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. And if you wish, let us make your three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then while he was still speaking, listen to this. It says, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased to hear him. Can I say the Father comes and he announces, and he says, This is my Son. But he doesn't just say, This is my Son. He says, This is my beloved Son. This is the son that I love. Listen to him. 
he comes and he announces to Peter, John, and James, and to Elijah, and to Moses. He says, listen to him, my son, the one I love. And when I talk about my kids, you know, I'll say Cameron and Aaron and, and Ryan, I don't always say, this is my beloved kid. But I should, because I love them. Um, and God the Father comes and he shows us, he says, look, the first thing that I want to tell you guys of being a father is love your kids. Be for them. Be there for them in everything that they do. But love them to everything. You see the love, if we have that love that we say that this is our beloved son. Um, I've heard over the last couple of weeks I spoke to Tony when I took him to the airport. I'm sorry he won't mind me telling the story. But both his kids, um, his two sons, didn't serve the Lord for many, many years. They fell away. One became an atheist, the other one is sort of just, oh, whatever happens will happen. Um, and I can think as a father that that must be very hard. It must be when you look at your kids, you think, well, oh, we've got three kids here, six here, and how many kids have we got? Four, three, four kids. If just one of them do not follow God, how will we react to them? What will we do with them? How will we speak to him? How will we speak of him? And others, will we still say, He is my beloved son? I can promise you, most men in today's world won't say that. They will write him off, they will forget about him. I heard a story a couple of years ago about a, um, a father and his uh, wife, husband and wife, and they had a son which grew up in a very Christian world. Uh, or house. And he grew up and he started serving God and he gave his heart to Jesus. And then they got a message one day, he was about 25 years old, that he had shot somebody and killed him out of anger. They knew the son. They spent many hours with him. And people started saying, well, geez, what happened to his son? Why did he do him like that? And, they, and the father's also like, my son kills somebody? There's no way. He, he, he can't do that. So he went to jail because now he eventually ended up in jail. And he said, but why did you do it? He said, Dad, I don't know. I just got anger in my heart towards this one person. I was dating somebody and her ex-boyfriend came and wanted to do something and hurt her and I got anger in my heart and I shot him. Killed him. He said, Dad, I'm so sorry I did it. I've already apologized to God. And the father just continued loving his son. And he was in jail for 15 years because of one little mistake that he did. But still that father never gave up on his son. Still that father said, this is my beloved son. And what I want to see also just note in this verse is that God says here, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He says, when we are done to the father, he wants to be able to say to us that he is well pleased in what we are doing for him. And Jesus was all of that. He was the example of doing exactly what the Father wanted him to do. You see, if we want to be Christians and we want to be children of God, as the word says, we become sons of the living God and we accept Jesus in our heart, we need to be like Jesus. And Jesus had no fail. He had no sin in him. For 33 odd years that he was on earth, he never sinned. Never even thought something wrong. But he was led by the Spirit. And when we want to be sons of the Father, we need to walk like Jesus did. We need to be able to say that, Lord, lead us in everything that we need to do. And the same way that Jesus did everything according to what the Father said he must do, the same way we must do as well. A God reveals his heart here. He says, I love my son. I am well pleased in him. A 2 Peter 1.17 says, um, Jesus received honor and glory when he said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Honor and glory. How great is it? Eric, what Eric is it? Who for ye? As your partner say, yes. Yay is an awesome scene. Really good. You feel awesome. Jesus received honor and glory because of the God the Father saying to him, You are my son. You I love. 
above everything. I'm well pleased. Honor and glory we received when God said those words. John 5, verse 16, if you turn with me there quickly. John 5. I want to show you this morning again just that God the Father and God the Son has always been together. Everything that they did, they did together. And from verse 16 it says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered and said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Together they've been working. Together they formed the earth. Together they've been planning. Together they died on the cross. Together Jesus was raised up for us to have glory. Together they did these things. And therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he, is, he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. And he says, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. See, Jesus and God is inseparable. They've been together. They're one being, yet two entities. But yet the, the son does nothing without the father doing it first. The son will not walk until the father says walk. The son will not heal until the father says heal. And yet all authority has been given to Jesus. How amazing is that? That he still will not until his father says so. And that's the kind of thing that we try and teach our kids, is that we should listen first time. And your parent talks to you, and I think in this a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, she had a small thing here with the kids, and she said one of those verses that said that you should obey your parents in all things, that you have a happy and lost. I can just imagine that when we do that, and we are sons of God, and we listen to the Father, that's what Jesus listened to his Father. And as he still listens to his Father, what an amazing life we all have. And when we start doing that in the Spirit, and we walk in the Spirit, we live in the Spirit, we eat in the Spirit, what an amazing life we would have. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel at it. And we can marvel at the fact today that God the Father loved the world so much that he gave his son, his beloved son, the child that he cherishes to the world so that he could die so that everybody could have a life. How amazing is that? Um, if you just think about it, would you as a, as a father offer your son freely? Without thought? Yes, that will be hard. I can't even imagine what Abraham went through when God told him, take Isaac and go off and kill him. On the outside, he might have looked like a man. You know, how strong I can do this. And inside, I'm sure he had turmoil and, and brokenness and heartache and pain and sadness in his heart because of what God has asked him to do. But we all know it was a test to see Abraham's faith towards God at the end. In the same way that we, as Jesus, have to trust the Father, the same way we have to trust Jesus. See, when we get the sonship, when we receive Jesus, we become like Jesus. See, his fullness is inside of us. And when we're walking in that fullness, God the Father we can cry out, our spirit cry out, Abba, Father. But that only happens when we start walking that path with Jesus. Up until then, God the Father is just God. He's just a being that's in heaven somewhere controlling something. He's not the Father. Until you accept him as the Savior Jesus. And then the Father becomes your father, the same way. Let's get a lucky word. Read with me Isaiah quickly. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 
I've said this before, but what's beautiful about the Bible is that the Old Testament always confirms the New, and the New Testament always confirms the Old Testament. And you can see Jesus through all of it. You could read the Old Testament and not see Jesus because you're not looking for him. But when you really want to find Jesus, you can see him in every verse almost. Verse 1 of Isaiah 42 says, Behold, and this is God speaking through his prophet Isaiah. He says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit in him. God Father delights in his son. And I want to ask this this morning as fathers, there's only one, two, three, four, five fathers here this morning, but do you delight in your kids, even when they do wrong? You see, we are human. We make mistakes. As fathers, as, as uh, uh, men, we do make many mistakes. Let's just ask our wives. They can tell us a long list of things that we do wrong. But when we speak to our kids, and they are our beloved. And we are so glad that they're part of our lives. That things can change. When I speak to my kids, and every evening when they go to bed, I try and tell them that I love them. And I don't do it just because of habit. I try and do it because I mean it person, and that they can hear it. And that's something that the Word says, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. If I keep on telling them and they hear it, somehow, someday, they will believe it. You see, I can have all the actions maybe in the world, but if I don't say it as well, it won't always work. But God the Father shows us how a father should be. And he says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He says, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. This Father God that we've now got as ever Father also wants to go life in us. He also wants us to follow Him like Jesus follows Him. So what does God's love for His Son mean for us today? Now Romans 5 verse 8, you can turn there. Again. Romans 5 verse 8. This is what it means of God's love for His Son. means for us. It says, God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How amazing is that? It, it baffles my mind that a father can take his son and give it to an undeserving people. Undeserving. Never in the history of the world can one man stand up and can say that I deserve it. Not one man. Not a David. Not a Solomon. Not an Adam. <laughs> from the beginning. No man can say that today. And we can think, I'm great. I'm good. I serve God and I do things. But still here today, we cannot say that we deserve it. And this is the love of a father that gave his son. So that yet while we are sinners, or were sinners, he gave to you. That's just amazing. Not to realize of what the love of the father is, really. That's amazing. 1 John 4, verse 7 to 8. You can turn there if you want to, or you can just listen. 1 John 4, from verse 7 to 8. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This morning, as God loves the Son, and we've come into that citizenship, sonship with Jesus, God is saying this morning, that love that I have for my Son must also be within you, so that you can love one another. And that love is unconditional. It's not a love that says, well, I will love you if you do this. It's not a love that says, well, if you do this right, I will do this. How often do 
I'm just talking about my own experience with our own kids, but how we try and teach our kids not to react in a certain way to a sibling because the other sibling did something wrong. <laughs> because it's like, yes, definitely. <laughs> how often I do that? Almost every day. I would say to Erin, no, you can't talk like that to your brother. And she'll say, no, but he screamed at me or he threw something or he did something. I'm, I said to him, but you can't. Love should be in us. And in, if that love is in us, we react in the way that God wants us to react. Yes, we're human and we make mistakes. But that's what I believe as Hebrews 6 talks about, that we will go on to perfection. Things like that will become less and less. But as you submit your heart to God every day, it will happen. God wants us to love one another. That means that when fault in the one another, in fellowship, if somebody is doing something wrong, or we go and talk to a brother, or we talk to a sister about something that is not right, we do it in love. We do not attack. We do not go and throw him out of the house. We do not do things like that. Or if there's somebody we don't like that much, as this fellowship grows, I can tell you there will be people that might not like me or I might not like them. But it takes nothing away of the fact that Jesus, because he lives in my heart and I perceive the love of love in my heart, that I should love it. Take nothing away from that. God wants us to love one another. Beloved, let us love one another, for love of God is in us. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. It is an amazing thing to be able to call God Abba Father. It's an amazing thing to call Him Father. Now for me, He might not have had a dad. It's probably a harder thing to do because I don't understand it really. I, don't, um, I didn't experience it. But if I look at maybe, hopefully, the way my kids are being raised and the Fisses and the Vickerses and all these people, the way you're raising your kids will allow them to find God the Father quicker. See, God the Father wants to love Jesus and He wants to love us exactly the same way. And that love is unconditional, like I said before. It doesn't ask questions. It doesn't say, well, if you do this, this will happen. He loves us. And now the scripture is very clear. If we do not love, we're not from God. That's a hard statement. Very hard. Because so often we, we, we get angered. We lose our cool. Something happens. And then we don't have, on the outside at least, showing the love of God. And then God says, but maybe you're not from me. What I think he's saying is that you're not walking in the Spirit anymore. You're not with him anymore. You don't have that connection with him anymore. At the moment, we can turn back to the Father and say, Father God, forgive me. For I know not what I do. You see, Jesus is the perfect example of a son. And as we look and learn from Jesus, we could look at the Father and we can get closer to him. You see, when you sit at Jesus' feet, you're actually sitting next to the Father as well. Because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. How awesome is that? You're not just sitting at one pair of feet. You're sitting at two pairs of feet. And you're sitting at the one who created heaven and earth. You're sitting at the one who knows you inside out. He says he knows every single hair on your head. You must know me very well because there's lots of hair left. Uh, not many left. But he knows everything about you. So when we start having this relationship with Jesus, we start having this relationship with God because they are one. How amazing is that? 
in this love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the appropriation for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Because He did it, we should do it as well. Turn with me to Colossians 2, verse 9. Colossians 2, verse 9. Another amazing thing, and this morning, I just let me just say this. I don't want to try and be over-spiritual this morning. Um, I don't want to go into very deep detail and deep principles and theories and stuff. I want to give you a basic outline of what it is to serve God and how awesome it is to be able to call Him ever Father. Colossians 2, verse 9, it says, For in Him dwells, now we're talking about Jesus here, for in Jesus dwells all the fullness of God head bodily. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. God has placed Himself in His Son. And when we accept the Lord Jesus in our hearts, that Godhead is with us. With us. In our hearts. Automatically. Therefore, our spirits cry out, Abba, God. It doesn't happen before. And hope that it happened numerous times after that. God the Father loved us so much that He sent Him. When Jesus got fast, what happened? Can you guys remember? Dove came in the form of the Holy Spirit. A voice came out of heaven. What did he say? Same as he said before, confirming it. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. You see, God the Father's love is so big, so enormous, that he can only give it away. There's a song that says, um, You can't contain it. What's that song? in the song's name, but it goes on the lines of it's, he's so big we can't contain it. God's love for his son is so big that we can't contain it. We have to give it away. Freely give it unto us. And when he created heaven and earth and he created man and woman and beast and all these things, he created it out of love. Not because he already said, well, people should die, people should go to heaven. Uh, to hell at least. He didn't do it that side. He did it because he loved us. From the beginning, God's love started and God's love will end it. And we need to be with Christ. 1 John 3 verse 1. So two more verses I want to share with you. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, because we can be called sons of God. Sharon and I have had this conversation numerous times. Um, maybe one day we should adopt. I'm always sort of against it. Don't crucify me, please. Um, for a whole lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is that it's not mine. How can you 100% love somebody that's not really yours? It's difficult. Even if you had to look after somebody else's kid for a long period of time, it's difficult to love that kid the same as if you would love your own. But here the Father's love is so big for us. He's a doctor. He's brought us into the fold and He's given us a new life. How amazing is that? Do you believe it this morning? Do you believe that God's love is in you? You believe that you're the Son of God? You can only say that if 
if you have accepted the Lord Jesus in your heart, if you believe on Him, and as the word in, in Mark uh, 16, 16 says, that if you are then baptized, He has not been baptized yet. Anyone here? Couple of kids. Paul, not been baptized. We can have a baptism service one day. Soon. Turn with me to Romans 8. This just proves again to me that we are sons of God with the love of the Father. Verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with your spirit, or with our spirit, that we are children of This morning, I want to encourage you. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus in your heart, and you are following Him, and your spirit cries out, Abba, Father, I want you to remind yourself of that every day. That you are a son of God. You are a son of the Most High God. Sometimes we think ourselves so little. I'm not trying to lift up ourselves here, like full of pride or something like that. But what I'm saying to us this morning is that because we can cry out, Abba, Father, Jesus, because he's living inside of us, through him all things are possible. Not through us, not because we're so great, but because of him living inside of us. Because we've received that adoption in our hearts. Then only can we cry out, Abba, Father. Then only can we follow Christ fully. God's love was so big that he gave everything. Like I stated this morning, it's so difficult for a father in a physical realm to do that to his son. Yet God the Father did that to his son for us. And through that, many things have happened. And just one of them is that we are now called sons of God. So this morning, I leave you with that, that we are God's children. Remember that. I want to next week I'll share with you a little bit more about what it means to be a child of God. So this is an answer of what's to come. Amen. Now, awesome is that we don't have to wait for Pentecost. We don't want we don't want to wait for the fifty days. We can do it every day. Whenever we're in God's presence, we can do it. The Spirit will be poured out if you ask. Knock and it will be open. Ask and you will receive. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you.